What's up, good, bro? What's up? How you doing? I'm blessed, man. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Um, ran into you at uh, the Roots picnic. No, a Dune Day. Day. A Dune Day. Yeah, there's been Day. a lot going on, and um, I'm like happy to see you because you be traveling, you be around doing your thing all over the country with your poetry and other arts. Yeah. So before we get into all that. You started here in Philadelphia. Yes. This is your home. Yeah, South Philly. South to Philly. To be exact. Mm. Yeah. Mm, that's you, that's you were born and raised? Yeah, South Philly, born and raised. Okay, okay, okay. And um, so tell me about that, growing up in South Philly. Man, uh, inspirational, mm. for sure. I'm from an interesting neighborhood, uh, 20th and Mifflin. Okay. So the next little block over Siegel Street. And um, I, I just remember Mac. I, just, I seen Mac from uh, before to the end, well not the end, I mean until today. Um, so it was crazy, you know? And then like, soon as Mac took off, you go one block the other way, 20th and McKean, Emily Street, Mercy Street, they had meat there. So that must have been a hot pocket. I don't know what was in the water, that 20th Street water from right, Siegel right. to from Siegel to Snyder, you feel me? But I think, I think that was the first, that was the first piece of motivation because I didn't have to, I didn't have to go far to see somebody like, find what they love, stay good at it, and then make it out, in mm. a sense. Okay, okay, so since, so that's how they made it out with the, with the art, and then your art came to you, how did you meet poetry? Oh man, uh, uh, to keep it 100, I started off as a rapper. Um, I went to Bach, shout out to Bach Tech, R.I.P. Bach Tech, uh, Aphid Mifflin. Um, yeah, I started out at Bach, and it was crazy because I transitioned from a Catholic school. I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade, I did a week at Newman. Uh, it was all boys then. And, um, uh, you know, my mom was a single mom. So we had that tough decision like, do we have our, you know, do we take Mike and keep him in private school? Because it was to the point where only one of us, me and my little sister, could afford to go to Catholic school or private school, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I took the L, said, Mom, you know, I didn't got nine years of education, let my sister finish. Uh, and so she stayed in Catholic school. I dropped out of Newman, went to Bach. And I started rapping. <laughs> I started, yeah, I started rapping. I mean, I mean, uh, Showtime. <laughs> Showtime was my rap name. Um, but uh, I mean, I mean, everybody rapped though, you know. So that that lane was like super saturated. And then I wasn't. I, I just started rapping, and um, uh, I kind of fell out of rap. Uh, I got into trouble, kind of like this Will Smith shit. But I didn't go to Bel Air. I went to the military, and then. Um, I started rapping again in the military because imagine, you know, 300 guys on a ship for six months, you don't, you don't even see land, you know? So just being out on the water five, six months, we doing all kinds of shit. I learned how to play spades, learned how to play dominoes, and then I was rapping again. It wasn't until, after I got out of the military, maybe like 2000, 2008, 2009, I started hanging back around South Philly, and uh, shit, got rapping again. But this time, YouTube had just came out. And you know, you know niggas old when we talking about YouTube just coming out, but um, YouTube, I just came out and, uh, and that's when, um, shout out to Plumber, shout out to Diddy, they was doing I'm Not A Rapper, It's A Rap, all of those DVDs. If you go back to the first couple volumes of them Jones, you're gonna see me out there. I was out Tasker at the time, um, a lot of 27th Street, a lot of Tasker projects. And uh, it wasn't until uh, they used to bring the cameras out Tasker to the projects and it's like 30 niggas, all 30 of us rapping. And by the time it's time for me to rap, I just fold it. I'm like, man, uh, to keep it 100, it was like, like I, I used to be around the dudes that I watched the DVDs and start lining niggas up. Oh, this is where you be at. Oh, this is what you got on. Oh, that's you see the nigga in the back, he getting it. We gonna spin up there, you know? So the first thing that came to my mind is like that street mindset. It's like, man, I'm not about to get up here on this camera, lie about all these bricks, and when somebody come knocking on my mom's door looking for me, expecting all of this, and I ain't got it, it's gonna turn, it's gonna turn sour. So, right, so, you know, I, I kind of chilled off the rap thing, but I always, always liked to write. And it wasn't until I went through like some heartbreak that, um, that actually got me into, into writing because I had all these feelings and the shorty I had the feelings for, me and her wasn't really vibing, so I couldn't express them to her. So they was all bottled up. Wow. And writing became my therapy. And then the rest is just history. So you went from, you went to start writing about it and then to reciting. How was it when you started reciting? Because writing is one thing to be, you know, writing your thoughts and your emotions, but then to have the courage to send it to the people and say it publicly, that's a whole nother. You know, like, um, 
you know everything uh, yeah divine intervention i call it i feel like i feel like god because i'm connected to him like he orders my steps and there's no mistakes in like any part of my journey like everything had to happen the way it's supposed to happen so um uh, back before me and Shorty broke up, um, our cable was cut off, so we was crazy into the DVDs, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, sidetrack. You know, I, I was with a girl. We were both college students, broke as fuck, um, scratching and surviving. Our parents didn't want us to be with each other, little Romeo Juliet vibes, right? And uh, so we was basically on our own. So I'm saying here, I'm trying to, you know, provide for me and a chick. And you know, shit gotta get cut. <laughs> First thing that was getting cut was the cable. So long story short, um, DVDs were still popping and there was this one website that was giving out free DVDs or cheap DVDs like used joints. And we ordered the whole Deaf Poetry joint, that, that right? Classic. Right, classic. I, got, I still got them, all of the DVDs from all of the Deaf Poetry. And then when I started sticking them in, I'm like, oh, this is fire. And it kind of resonated with me because it was like rap, but it wasn't. That was the first time I was probably, you know, uh, I witnessed poetry. I mean, because before I'm thinking Langston Hughes and fucking uh, shit, Maya Angelou. And I'm like, yeah, that don't relate to me. But when I, I got in that deaf poetry, I'm like, wow. I'm like, this is fire. So next thing I did is like, yo, I want to see this live. I, wanted, I wonder if his place is in Philly. And then um, I ended up at the Harvest. Me and Shorty, same Shorty I wasn't, that ended up going through that crazy stuff with. But if it wasn't for us being broke, I wouldn't have ordered the DVDs. Then uh, searching out the DVDs wouldn't have led me to the Harvest, and the Harvest is that is that platform they used to do it at World Ca uh, World Cafe Live. Um, this is like circa 2008-2009. Um, I went in there with her, and we thought that shit was the dopest shit ever. It was like shout out to everybody that was responsible for the Harvest. That was a great platform for Philly, and um, I mean that was another essential part of my journey. So you fast forward, all right. Uh, I transitioned from rap into poetry by way of the girl, by way of the, the DVDs, by way of the harvest. Next thing you know, like I said, I was going through something. I had all of these words. I'm like, well, where am I going to take them? First place I took them was the internet, you know? Um, I got on Instagram probably first week it came out. No, no cap. It was only for Insta It was only for, um, for iPhone users at the time. And I actually turned in my Evo to get me an iPhone to get on Instagram, right? Um, circa, circa maybe 2010-ish, 2011-ish, right? Crazy. So, um, for me, I was cool with just posting my feelings on the internet, right? Because for me, that was my release, right? But it wasn't until, and this is crazy because um, a lot of the business books I read, it's like, you, you know, understand your market, understand your base, and figure out what your base wants from you. And my base wanted me to write poems, and I wrote poems. Then my bass wanted me to perform poems. So me performing wasn't really something I wanted to do. It was to serve the people that were serving me, giving me that, oh, yo, this is dope, yo, this is dope, yo, you should write more, yo, you should write more. So I, I felt like I had a voice and I'm just listening to these people and not, not, not realizing that that was the start of my career. And it's funny because to hear you say that now, sitting with you saying how you started writing because of your feelings and reciting your poetry because of the breakup, I, I know you to have a sold out show at TLA. I yeah. know you to have at least a minimum of four books published. Yeah. So it's like that's heavy that you took something and mastered it, and, and now you're you're making money off of it, and, and, and you're inspiring people off of that. Cause that's heavy. Like yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, it's crazy. I could not have, you know, I'm a writer, but I could not have written my life, wrote my life uh, any any more perfect than what it was. I mean, that's divine intervention for sure. I thank God every day. Because um, if it if it wasn't for his his hand on my back, bro, I, none of this would have been possible, and I'm so I'm so grateful. Yeah, I remember you uh, before for TLA. You were like heavy in the culture of just helping people get platforms, such as uh, Jamal Hall, Vision, um, Seth. Like it was a lot Crazy. of people, and yeah. see what you did for them. Like 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 they helped you as well too. They gave you people to open up for you, but as well as like you gave them platforms, took them on tours. Yes. I mean, for me, it's all about it's all about the reach back. Um, I mean, because uh, uh, a lot of uh, too many people too many people get popping and dip, yeah. you know. Um, and the, the the reach back thing is only 
is only handing out turkeys at Thanksgiving mm. or plastic toys at Christmas, you know? It's like, I'll reach back in a way that's gonna put your artists on. Like, you can't, you can't name me the last time a platinum artist from Philly put on another artist who turned platinum. It don't happen. I mean, they sign people just for the sake of signing people or signing people because they want them to write for them or signing people because the streets is pressuring them into doing something. But nah, I mean, and then it's like, most people, most people wait till they get to the top and then try to yell down and throw a mat back. It's like, nah, man, like I'm still on my way up, but you could come with me every step of the way. And it's crazy because it was all organic. Um, the first time I went to the harvest to perform a poem, it was because people told me to go. And I, didn't, I just put it up on a post like, hey, y'all want me to go do, perform poetry? I'm going to this spot this day. And 40 people came out. And then the dude who introduced me uh, was Vision. So he was the host that night. And the dude spitting after me was Jamar Hall. Mm. And one of the organizers of the event was just Greg. And then fast forward seven months, it's like, yo, they like, yo, I don't know what you're doing out here, but the shit is fire. How can I help you? And you know what I'm saying? And this is me after one poem, one night, one stage. They kind of felt it. And I'm like, man, I don't know shit about none of this stuff. I just got a couple poems and I just be giving them to people and they fuck with it, you know? But it was, it was that, it was that, that love. Like it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It's not like, it's not like when somebody, you know, my biggest problem with people, bro, is that when they see somebody new in the same space they, that they're in, they automatically see this person as a threat. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a minimalist mindset, mm -hmm. and that really needs to change. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, God forbid that these people saw me as a threat, so they would maybe blackball me or not support me. It's like, yo, you're dope. We, we dope too. We don't see you as a threat. We want to help you grow, young boy. Let, let me wrap my arms around you and push you further. Next question, you think that's because, that's, that's a good point you made, because I did see how the poetry was more united. But do you think it was because it was poetry and not rap? Like, do you think if you were a rapper, it would have the same? Uh, 100%, 100%. Because poetry stems from love, either a love of words, a love of self, or a love of an agenda. Whereas rap, uh, rap maybe, maybe circa 1990 uh, forward, is all about violence, aggression, selfishness, greed. You know what I'm saying? Right. 90, 95% of rap. Mm. Shout out to Cole and Kendrick. But it's, it's, it, you automatically have, because you're a rapper, you, you automatically have enemies, ops, beef, tension. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a culture. I mean, it's, uh, so you can't necessarily blame any individual. Mm. I think it's just the culture of rap. In a, in a traditional sense that just kind of fosters that sort of animosity between people. You know what I'm saying? Ever since, I mean, Biggie and Pac, I don't think it's ever stopped. Ever since Biggie and Pac became the two biggest rappers in the world off of beef, not off of beef, but they, it, it highlighted the crescendo of their careers was simultaneously, you know, uh, connected with the, the time of them feuding. Ever since then, it's kind of been that thing. But because of poetry, just being love-based, being people-based, being culture-based, and just be, it, it having a longer history than rap, I think I think everybody does that out of love. So all, that's all I got from love. That's all I got from poetry, except for this one show I did in um, in London one time. London. And yeah, they booed me. They booed me. I mean, it wasn't my show. It was um, it, it was I just before I was able to fill my own arenas in in different cities, I would find a poetry venue that had already had a situation and just show up. Okay. Right. Um, a lot of times people wouldn't. It wasn't until I had K's next to my Instagram followers yeah. that people started to take me serious. But most times I'd be like, hey, my name is Mike. I'm trying to spit. Can I can you let me know if I can spit before I tell all my people to come? Mm. And they're like, young boy, please. Mm. Yeah, the list come out seven o'clock. Get there six fifty five and sign the list. So I'm like, all right, you know me, I'm humble pie. I don't like to make no waves. I don't like to throw no one sheets or no awards or no credentials at nobody. I respect the game. You know, you'll, once you see me, you'll see me, you feel me? So um, yeah, there's one time I went to London and London is like um, uh, the feminist, this was maybe circa 2015. And it was my first time in London doing a show. It was actually the night before. No, 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 no. This, I didn't do a show in London this time. Maybe I did. I forget. It's been so long ago. Um, but I went to a, a show in London, and a lot of the a lot a lot of the poetry that I preach is like uh, I guess they call it women empowerment. 
but it's kind of slow for for like progressive feminists because it seems like I'm attacking. Like if you don't know me and you just hear one of my hardcore poems about how you got to stop doing this weird shit with these niggas because it's it's to your detriment. If this is your first time hearing me, like what the fuck is boy talking about? It's my I'm a woman. I it's my body. Who the fuck is this nigga trying to tell me what to do with myself? You feel me? So it was kind of like, you know, like my, my, my hardcore fans follow me for like 45 minutes. We actually ended up being like seven Ubers deep. Uh, I took them all out to dinner. It was like 45 of them. But people who didn't hear me at that London joint, they kind of was, they wasn't feeling it. Right, right, right. Damn, so. But yeah, man, um, no, nah, poetry doesn't owe me anything. If anything, I owe poetry a lot more um, because because, um, nah, I, I, I mean, just between the creator and my craft, I owe him, I owe him everything. That's why I'm kinda, um, I'm kinda back out here, in a sense, on my way back out here. So think about LA real quick. I know you was out late for a little bit, right? Yeah, man, you know, um, I think the biggest, I think the biggest detriment to my career as a poetry has been my desire for love, right? It's crazy to say because my desire for love is probably what made me a poet because love didn't work, which made me start a writing. But every time I meet somebody I think I want to spend the rest of my life with. Are you single right now? Uh, for sure. Um, there's, there's, there's also another girl that I like right now, but are we going, you know? I mean, but no, nah, you got to understand that I'm, before, I, before I was even old enough to get a woman pregnant, I wanted to be a husband and a father. Mm. Partially because I watched um, my mother struggle so hard as a single parent. I watched what drug abuse, uh, domestic violence, and lack of faith can do to a relationship. Right. So that shit fucked me up. I mean, I did not, I mean, I appreciate the fact that I became the man of the house at nine years old. By 11 years old, I was food shopping, driving cars, doing homework, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate that because that, that can't oppose to me in the manhood. But at the same time, you know what I'm saying? I, I wanted this, you know what I'm saying? I was watching Different World before I was a poet. I was watching Family Matters before I was a poet. I was watching the Huskables. I was watching, you know what I'm saying? Like my, my mindset, even though my, my immediate surrounding wasn't black love, I aspired to, to do that, to kind of like, you know what? Just because I'm not this way doesn't mean I can't have this sort of life. Right. So I've been praying for my wife before I could put my hands together, you feel me? So and that, that's the quest that I've been on this whole time. Now in the interim, I've written books, I've helped other people write books, done all these great things, but my heart still wants to be a husband and a father. Um, so that's kind of been it's kind of been slowing me up uh, because had I you know had I locked into my purpose the way that I would have I'd probably be a lot larger, but at the same time what is large, I mean like you said it's all divine it's, time everything lined up for you everything for sure you and then and then fame is fleeting and rich is relative so all of these things that you you really chase uh, are are not necessary they're futile. And, um, you know, this, the scoreboard guy keep don't got none of this stuff on it. Like, how many lives you changed? You, you feel me? No, 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 don't do me like that, bro. Oh, man. Don't do me like that. Easy, man. I need to take a sip of water. Yeah, man, you got that good pen. Um, so, you know, we're in the summertime. We're in, we're in the middle of June. So, I know you got some good things coming up. You got a summer tour, I see. Um, summer fest, tell us what's going on. Oh, yeah, back to L.A., actually. So, yeah, uh, I went to L.A. in the middle of the pandemic because um, I thought I was gonna fall in love. And I'll do anything for love, bro. I'll do anything for love. I packed up my shit. I packed up my shit in three days and moved to Long Beach on the strip of somebody I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life with. It didn't work. It didn't work, but um, ain't nothing like waking up on Christmas. I flew my mom off for Christmas. We on the beach, it's 82 degrees, you know what I'm saying? So it just taught me that um, my body ain't built for this cold weather shit. <laughs> so this this winter, I'm out of here, man, because I don't believe my body belongs in below 40 degree oh, temperatures. Yeah. No. But right now, I'm going to keep it 100. Right now, like, I'm torn, man. Like, um, I'm at this interesting position where uh, financially, I don't need poetry. So I really got to be in it for the passion. Mm -hmm. And right now, I don't have the passion. Mm -hmm. And then another thing you do, I'm suffering from escapism in the sense that I try to do all these other things to stop me from my purpose, right? And uh, I'm, I'm heavy into real estate, okay. right? Um, big deterrent. I mean, yes, I've, uh, I, I've increased my wealth. I've uh, given black families um, great accommodations in gentrified neighborhoods for below market rates. 
and I'm proud of that while still making a profit. So just because the rent in your neighborhood is $17.50, you don't got to make it $17.50 because you, you, if, you gotta, if you do it right, you know what I'm saying? You can make money, but not make all the money you can make. But at the same time, that extra $300 that you're charging, you taking two, two uh, Chuck E. Cheese visits and, and, and 10 toys out of out of a single mom's pocket because you want to tax the rent. Mm. Or you making her move out in a crazy neighborhood where the rent's cheap, you know what I'm saying? But the danger's high. But, but the danger's high. So, um, I mean, uh, I've done everything from started a publishing company, um, uh, I'm a government contractor, um, I'm a real estate uh, developer and property manager and landlord, and I'm doing all of these things. And they're all financially lucrative uh, but they don't give me the, the fulfillment spiritually poetry, like yeah. poetry does. But I'm so deep in this shit now that it's a fight. I almost got to fight every day to carve out time for poetry, which is where my discipline is coming. And I'm so sad because, um, you know what I'm saying? How do you kick people out of a club that's popping? Metaphorically speaking, like how do I, how do I be like, yo, I don't want no parts of this business, or hey, I gotta shut this business down, or hey, you know what, let me find somebody to manage the property. You know what, I don't even wanna buy no more cribs. Like I stopped getting emails from Redfin and Zillow and Realtor.com because I don't even wanna see another steal on the market because my purpose isn't, I don't think God is pleased with me. I don't think God is pleased with me, so that's, I need to do, I owe him, I owe him, I owe him. Now God is, God is so good that um, he gives me this wisdom before it's too late, but now the onus is on me. So, uh, I mean, to, to bring that back full circle right now, uh, I'm kind of starting from the ground up with the same knowledge that I had last time. Um, uh, you still, you just might the poet, but you just might the poet without trying to be it. You already are it, so you just add everything around it. So right, and I'm tapping back into, I'm tapping back into my old self. So these tours, like these shows that I'm going on, they're not, they're not Mike shows. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm bringing my crowd back to where it started, other people's venues, right? Because we're stronger together. So instead of me getting a venue and doing it, I want to bring my 150 people into your, into your situation mm. because that way they get fed even after I'm gone. So instead of me being this super capitalist, like, you know what? Let me call Marriott, get my own, get my own conference room, uh, charge these people just to see me. I could do a show right, and right. it could last an hour and a half. Why not say, you know what, bro? Just give me 500 to come to your joint. I pay my own travel. I put my own stuff in my hotel because I don't really need the paper. I just, I just want to bring 150 people that never knew probably about Sure Event down in Austin, Texas. But I got fans in Austin, Texas. Let me, not, let me not be so greedy and to put all the money in my pocket. Let me send them to your venue. That way when I leave Austin, they can still get filled after I'm gone. I love it. Right? So uh, every show that I'm doing this summer is in another black-owned um, poetry venue that's run by another black creative and I just want to pour into the people that keep poetry alive because I'm not one of them. a dollar as well. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I 100% believe in it, circulating the back dollar. A thousand percent. I will, eat, I will eat the same food from two stores all week long because they're the only two black stores that I know in my area, you feel me? And it might, be, it might be small, but if everybody did that, it's like, damn, do I want fish again? Hell yeah, I'm gonna have fish and grits, I'm gonna have a fish hoagie, I'm gonna have fish on fish on fish, because that's all my black people make. And I don't care, I don't care if I gotta drive past two fish spots to get to this black fish spot, you feel me? But that's what it is. Yeah, we definitely appreciate you keep, you know, supporting the black community and keep everything inside, because that's what we need to do. I could do Large better, scale. I could do better, I will do better, but, uh, just being just being conscious of it is the first step. Um, that's important. How you feel about ACAV? Um, man, talk about diamond in the rough, bro. Talk about diamond. I just thank God for seeing you because seeing you brought me here, and um, I like everything here from the body butters to the incense to the teas. I think I'm gonna grab some tea on the way out. I mean, but it's just. I mean, this is just another thing that I don't gotta get from Amazon when I want some ashwagandha. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? If I, if I need some black soap, my first thing to do is uh, Amazon black soap and hope the person I buy from uh, get that little black owned badge. But now I can just spend to the deuce. You know what I'm saying? We here, we here. So before just, just make it out of here, I want to know about this Mellow Fest I keep seeing all over. You know, um, Mellow Fest is interesting because uh, 
I'm um, 95% of the time on my shows, I think I'm the headliner. 95, 99.9. I don't think, I think, uh, one time I did a, spa- a stage play in Atlanta and there were a couple of, um, you know, like real actors on it and I wasn't like the draw, but usually I'm like the draw. So the, the cool thing about Mellow Fest is one is Juneteenth, one, uh, two is 800 people, three, it's just got um, so many different legends on it. Myself, Black Ice, uh, Georgia Me, Talib Kwale, um, uh, a bunch of a bunch of a bunch of fire poets. K Love. Um, I mean, it's just a it's just a beautiful situation. Uh, it's actually in uh, South Florida, so um, somewhere in between. It's Davie, Florida, kind of in between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. And um, uh, crazy enough, my mom turned sixty five the same day as the show, and she wanted to go to Miami. So that's a blessing. So um, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take five minutes uh, out the show, and I mean out my set. And make them sing my mom happy birthday because I love her That's so much. Uh, so you're about to be basically in the echelon of the legends. Yeah, I think I think I think um, I used to I used to think that um, I used to think that money was the currency that made me feel good the most. But really, it's recognition. Really, it's like you know what? If I want to put together a fire performance, who do I want to bring? You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of other poets who probably charge way less than me, who are probably more famous than me, but for them to reach out to me on such a star-studded lineup is, is a blessing. It's, I guess it's a testament to the grind. And um, I mean, I might, not, I might not win no Grammys or no Source Awards, BET Awards, but just getting phone calls from certain people to be a part of certain things is dope. So uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I want to tell you this. It's like, it's important for us to be somebody, like you're somebody, like people know who you are and it's like, we gotta build the kingdom in order for people to come in, they brought women and children coming to live. So it's for like, sure. right now you're building your kingdom. Like for when sure. you do have your family and when you do meet your queen, like you have so much to offer, so much to give, cause you've been building for so long. So just everything will come to you cause it's all happening for you. Yes, I sir. appreciate you, man. Yeah, like, I appreciate you, man. Fresh, man, um, uh, for those who don't know, I've known Fresh pretty much my whole career as a poet, man. And um, I never met a more genuine human being in my life, bro. I mean, a broke ass 75 cent and will give you a dollar. You feel me? And I don't know, I don't know nobody else like that. I don't know nobody else like that. So I love, bro, I love you so much. Just as a vessel, as a light, as a hustler, as just a black man, as a father, man, as just as a good, just as a good dude, man. A good dude, a good dude, man. I, I just wanna give you your flowers, bro, because every time I see you, it's positive vibes. I don't care what you got going on in your life, man. I pray for you daily, bro, yeah, just because yeah, we need yeah. lights like that out here. You know what I'm saying? Like genuine cats, man. Genuine cats who not in it for the money, not in it for the fame, just inspiring the people, bro. So as long as, as long as you know me, dog, uh, you fucking covered, my uh, nigga. You kidding good, me? Thank you for coming out. Oh man, it's a pleasure, bro. I appreciate you for having me, man. Oh, shout man. out to y'all. Shout out to A Cap. Make sure y'all follow A Cap One, Just Mike, and the Fresh Legend. Peace. <laughs>